with the Indominus Crusade in full effect, and even Games Workshop moving their paint jobs into more battle-worn direction, I thought it's time we talked about weathering. When it comes to weathering, emulating chipped paint and scratches on surfaces is a widespread approach to add some gritty realism. And there's a lot of shortcuts that you can take to get the resemblance of this onto your miniatures quickly. But there's a lot of pitfalls on the way and sometimes the results just look terrible and we're going to look at why that is and how you can avoid it. So in this video I'm going to show you what to be aware of when doing chipping and how to make it look more credible on your miniatures. We're only going to use acrylics for the weathering videos because while there is a lot to learn from scale modelers when it comes to this topic, I don't want you to have the feeling that you have to get another 20 additional paints and products when we can achieve awesome results with the products that we already have. And if you're anything like me, then you already have enough paints. Now let's chip away. Before you start, think about where it makes sense to put chipping and scratching. When we look at where vehicles scratch and paint chips off, we can see that there is a tendency for paint to wear on edges and protruding elements. Moving objects obviously also scratch in a very distinct way, visible here as parallel horizontal lines. You can also see how when the surface gets scratched, we first see the bright primer layer that goes on before the final paint. And then, if the scratches go deeper, we see the darker material that the body is made of. As these imperfections in the paint stay untreated and age, we can of course also see corrosion creep into the metal, resulting in these typical stain patterns. I'm going to make a separate video on corrosion, but this picture is a nice reference for scratch patterns and how they are made up from both lines and bigger and smaller dots. It's always good to look at reality because this is what our brains are used to seeing. Choose your method wisely. There is a few ways to apply chips. Initially, I said we are only going to use acrylics. So what about the hairspray technique? The hairspray method sounds like an awesome shortcut, but in reality, it's not an easy technique because of all the experience and practice you need to get it to look right. A lot of people don't know how to properly do it and I constantly see YouTubers use it wrong as well. With the hairspray method, it's really hard to get credible chipping and it takes a lot of knowledge to find a method to get rid of the top color layer so that the chipping doesn't look out of scale. This is an example of me doing the method one day before Golden Demon. Obviously I failed miserably under the time pressure. So while it sounds fast, it's also easy to screw up when done too quickly and without thought. But it looks good here on the edges where I use it more carefully. Sometimes the layer just flakes off too much or not properly or not at all. And in general, it's just a really random technique because the result varies greatly. So in my opinion, you have two options, using the sponge method or painting chips and scratches by hand. There's pros and cons to either technique but before we get into that, let's first look at them one by one. For the sponge method, you can use a blister sponge or any other foam you have lying around. Rip a piece out and get rid of a few more parts to create additional randomness. I'm mixing a brighter shade of the color I want to chip and I prefer to do that in a container instead of on the wet pal. Because I can get the paint deeper into the sponge and the patterns will look better that way. Next you want to get rid of most of the paint until the sponge leaves a pattern like this. You don't want to have too much paint on the sponge, which would look something like this. And neither should the paint on the sponge be too dry or you will get a lot of these very thin specks. And that also looks very unrealistic. You also want to just dab the sponge onto the surface lightly and not move it into any direction because it would leave line patterns and smudged chips that don't look very credible either. I'm trying to create something ugly, but I guess this doesn't look too bad after all, just a bit much maybe. 
And doing this, I guess you could try to recreate some of the horizontal marks we saw in the initial reference pictures. Focus the chipping on the edges first and make sure to get random patterns. Only after all the edges are defined that way, you can also think about treating the main surface, depending of course on how scuffed you want the surface to look. Round parts like these typically get banged up on the apex of the curve because it's basically an edge as well. Make sure the dots you leave behind aren't too big and even if you put down larger chips like these, you want the edges on them to look jacked. Else it looks too flaky like with this bad hairspray chipping. An advantage of this technique is that you can cover a lot of ground very quickly. The downside of course is that you are not entirely in control of what is happening. On one side it's nice to have the element of randomness which helps with realism, on the other hand it's easy to screw up by pressing too hard or too little. A more controlled way is to paint the surface wear by brush. Obviously here you have a lot more control but it can be challenging to create dots and lines that are not too regular. A good way to avoid that is to turn your model or the brush while you dab it on. I'm using a smaller size brush for this. In this case, a size 0 Winsor Newton to make sure I have a good tip and can do really thin lines. Make sure you always have enough more or less undiluted color on the brush, because if the paint gets too dry or too diluted, you won't leave consistent strokes and that will look weird because it won't cover as much. In my opinion, you get the best results by combining both techniques. First dab on some initial layers with the sponge and then combine or connect some of the smaller chips and add additional scratch lines. I really like this result even though some of the chips ended up a bit large. Chipping and scratching decals with the color below integrates the symbols with the surface and makes them appear like they are part of the mini. When you are doing this, make sure that the surrounding area is damaged in the same way the decal is. For example, you want to align scratches the same way on the surface and on the decal. Also, you want to adapt the shape of your chips to where they are on the mini. For example, on this bike, it's probably a good idea to have some scratch marks along the front parts because hitting something at full speed would create these distinct scratch lines like we saw in the references at the start. Now you probably noticed that we did not add any of the darker chipping we initially talked about to the inside of the bright patterns on the blue surface. But before we look at why you cannot apply the same chipping approach to every color, let me thank this video's sponsor Skillshare. Now before you skip ahead, this offer is absolutely free and you get a ton of knowledge that is just a click away. I've spent a lot of time watching Skillshare classes during the last months and they have helped me improve things like my miniature photography. They taught me a lot of great tricks for software I use on a daily basis and you can learn a lot of creative activities from the ground up in a very concise and thorough way watching Skillshare classes. A lot of these activities you can do with your whole family. Like we had a lot of fun on the weekend trying watercolor painting for the first time. If you want to try any of this yourself, you can for a limited time use the link in the description to get a free trial of Skillshare Premium Membership. And yes, that means access to all the classes absolutely for free and you can support my channel at the only expense of however long it takes to sign up. Check it out. So like I mentioned, the way we apply the chipping depends a lot on the color we're using on the mini. We as miniature painters have a bit of a problem when it comes to chipping compared to when scale modelers are using this technique. We use all these fancy, intense and saturated colors while scale modelers usually deal with more muted and desaturated colors. That means we have to adapt our approach a bit, especially when it comes to the two layer chipping, when you can see the foundation under the paint job and the material below. 
I almost feel like the effect is completely lost on a dark color like on this blue. It brings down the overall result quite dramatically and makes everything too busy. There simply is too much going on and not enough contrast. So in this example, I use a brighter green base color like you would have on a Solomon Space Marine, for example, and I mix in a bright lemon color to apply the initial chipping on the edges and where it makes sense because of how the bike moves. I decided to paint the chipping by brush only on this one and you can see that I can create very controlled patterns with this and I have absolute control about how the individual chips look. After I was happy about the placement, I took a mix of black and Rhinox hide and filled in dark spots directly on the lighter chipping to represent dents that went deeper into the surface. And you can see in the result that it looks pretty good. Now if we compare that to the dark blue armor of the Invictus suit, you can see the difference and why you have to take the base color into consideration before deciding what approach you take. The brighter your main colors get, I feel like you can get away with just using dark colors for chipping. Like I did on this yellow for example, or on this very bright surface which is an off-white color, on these you probably want to chip with a dark color right away. So be aware that due to how we perceive contrast, the situation changes if you have darker or brighter base colors. And depending on that, you might have to drop one of the steps and just use either bright chips or only dark ones and plan your projects ahead accordingly. Using chipping and edge wear to increase contrast. A bit of a neat trick to increase contrast on your miniatures is to work with cool and warm colors in combination. Warm highlights, for example, always kind of demand cool chatter colors to create realism and credibility. We can use this type of color interaction to create interesting contrasts without chipping as well. On this red space marine that you know from a previous video, I did use warm highlights. Now if you want the chipping to really stand out, you can add a cooler pink tone to the mix. And because this also creates a warm cold contrast, the edges stand out a lot more. There's more separation on the parts and the readability of the figure increases. And we can also add some additional detail on surfaces that might be too boring otherwise while we're at it. Chipping with metallics. Another great way to increase contrast and readability on a mini is to chip the edges with metallics. This works better the darker the base color is in my opinion. For example, on this black it works extremely well. You get a high value contrast because the metallics reflect a lot of light and almost look like white highlights. But since the reflected light changes while we turn the mini, our brain realizes there is a metal surface in there somewhere and we can get some extra realism through that. If the colors are brighter, we can add a bit of dark brown chipping around the edges first and then add the metallics like on this red space marine. The results look really good and it's really quick to do. So these are my beginner friendly thoughts on chipping only using acrylics. Let me know if you have any additional ideas on the topic in the comments. Make sure to subscribe if you are new to the channel and make sure to hit the bell to not miss the next video in the weathering series. If you learned something from this video or any of my other videos, consider supporting my Patreon campaign where you can get 150 additional videos as well as a lot of PDF guides. Any support there helps me do more videos like this in the process. I also have affiliate links in the description for stuff that every painter needs anyway. So you can support me while shopping for supplies like brushes and paints. And of course, you can join Skillshare for free through the link in the description and support me directly through that at no cost for you. Stay creative, don't be afraid to try new things and I'll see you in the next video.